All right, Chris, we live to go? Yep. All right, so thanks very much for coming in a Friday afternoon. Um, it's I'm glad to have with us today Ilya Salman from uh, George Mason University, Professor of Law at George Mason University. He nicely volunteered to give a talk to us while he was in town for the Federalist Society uh, National Student Conference tomorrow, where he's going to be speaking in the afternoon on, on a panel on federalism and democracy. So if you want to join for that, you can look at the Federalist Society website. You might be able to find the information for that for that event as well. Um, He's actually talking to us today, although he writes on a lot of different things. You might find his writings a lot on the blog Bollock Conspiracy quite a bit on all sorts of matters of, of law. But today he's going to talk about some more that he's been doing for, for a while now that culminated in this book a few years back, a couple years ago. Uh, revised edition last year. Last year, all right. So on Free to Move, and again, some of you might, might be familiar with the work of one of our scholars here, the Business Law the Center that writes one of our blogs, uh, Brian Kaplan, that works a lot on immigration as well. So I'm curious to see if there's any, what are the main points of contention between, between the two of you, if any, in this particular area. So Ilya, thanks for joining us and welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to the Salem Center for organizing this event and all of you for coming, particularly coming out on a Friday afternoon where I know particularly for students, that's often a time you have other more exciting things uh, to do. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk about my book, Free to Move, Voting, Migration, and Political Freedom. Ironically, the first edition of this book was published in April of 2020, right <laughs> as much of the world was going into the lockdown. Uh, but Oxford University Press and I later agreed that we would do a second edition and how we come out faster than second editions usually do. Among other things, I incorporated the pandemic and a number of other issues that came up in the last couple of years. If anything good comes out of the horrors of the COVID pandemic, perhaps it might be a new appreciation for the value of freedom of movement. Uh, so in the book, I'm gonna talk about how voting with your feet in different forms often is a better way of exercising political choice uh, than voting at the ballot boxes. Uh, I'll start off by uh, just mentioning the three types of foot voting that I discuss in the book. One is voting with your feet in a federal system. Uh, where you can choose what state or local government you want to live under based at least in part on the government policies. Another is foot voting in the private sector. I'll talk a bit more about exactly how that works when we get to that part of the presentation. And then finally, and most controversially, foot voting through international migration, which although it is the most controversial type, it's also the type where there are the greatest potential gains. Uh, but first things first, uh, we want to ask first, why should we even think about voting with your feet as a mode of political choice? After all, in the United States and other democracies, we typically think that the way we decide what government policies we want to live under is that we go to the ballot box. We choose the Democrats or the Republicans, Biden or Trump, or occasionally we might vote for a third party under the chance of them winning is extremely small, and that's what we mean by exercising political choice. And I think that definitely uh, has some value. Uh, however, uh, it is the case that foot voting, the voting at the ballot box has severe limitations. Uh, one of them is that the chance that your vote will make a difference is infinitesimally small. Uh, in an American presidential election, it's usually about one in 60 million. It can be a somewhat higher than that if you live in a swing state. If you live in a clearly red or blue state like Texas, the chance that your vote will make a difference is even smaller than that. Even in a state or local election, the chance your vote will make a difference is extremely low. In most cases, we would not say that you have meaningful freedom of choice if your decision has only a one in one billion or a one in 60 billion chance of determining the outcome. We wouldn't say you have meaningful freedom of religion if you have only a one in one million chance of being able to determine what faith you want to practice or whether you want to practice one at all. We wouldn't say you have meaningful freedom of speech if you have only a one in one million chance of being able to determine uh, what type uh, of uh, what, what, what type of speech you're allowed to express. Uh, you know, that's not significant freedom. And I would say that the same thing is true of political freedom. If you have only a one in one million chance or a one in 60 million chance of being able to determine uh, what government policies are going to be living under, that's not much of a political choice at all. Uh, now, the second uh, limitation of ballot box voting is very closely related to the first. 
And that is precisely because there is so little chance that your vote will make a difference. You have very little incentive to seek out information about the policies and issues that are at stake uh, and to make an informed choice. And in fact, in this book and in my previous book, Democracy and Political Ignorance, where I go into this in greater detail, uh, I uh, look at the evidence on what voters know and don't know, and it turns out that levels of political knowledge are extraordinarily low. Uh, most voters don't even know such basic things as what are the three branches of the federal government. Only about a third of Americans know what, what those things are. They often also don't know other basic things like which government officials are responsible for which issues, what are the effects of different government policies, uh, and so on. The American Medical Association says that before a doctor is allowed to treat you, they have to get your informed consent. Uh, now, most government policies, many of them at least, uh, often also have life and death implications just like uh, medical treatment sometimes does. We all saw that during the pandemic, but even during normal times, they can have a big impact on people's lives. Yet, under democratic government, for most people, most of the time, uh, government policy is like a doctor whose ministrations you're not allowed to refuse. And most of the patients have very little idea whether the doctor really is treating their disease or whether they're instead peddling snake oil that isn't doing any good and might actually make things worse. Uh, so there are these two significant weaknesses of ballot box voting uh, and foot voting actually is superior on both of these dimensions. When you vote with your feet, if you're allowed to do so, that's a decision that has a very high likelihood of actually making a difference. If you move from one state to another or one country to another, that ensures that you will in fact be living under the government policies of the destination rather than uh, under the ones you left behind. And for that very reason, both economic theory and extensive empirical evidence show that foot voters seek out more information than ballot box voters do and they generally do a better and less biased job of evaluating it. So uh, there's advantages uh, along both of those dimensions. If you're like most people, you probably spent more time and effort seeking out relevant information the last time you decided what television set to buy than the last time you decided who to vote for for president or in any other election. Uh, that's not because your television deals with more complicated issues than the president does, or that it's more important. It's that when you decide what TV to buy, you know that that's the one that will probably end up in your living room. Uh, but if you turn it on and you have the misfortune of seeing the president or the governor or some other powerful politician, the chance that you can affect who that is and what policies they will pursue is extraordinarily small. And therefore, most people spend much less time and effort on that decision, uh, not acquiring information uh, than uh, when they uh, decide how to vote with their feet. Uh, in the book, uh, I discuss how these two advantages of foot voting over ballot box voting, uh, they translate into superiority of foot voting from the standpoint of multiple different types of theories of political freedom associated with both the left and the right. I won't go through these theories in detail uh, here, but I'm happy to do so in questions. And uh, they certainly are a wide range of theories ranging from John Rawls theory to non-domination theory to consent theory uh, and others. So uh, it's not just one specific libertarian or specific other theory that it turns out these two factors matter. They matter from the standpoint uh, of a wide range of approaches uh, to political freedom. So I'll now try to take a closer look uh, at the three particular types of foot voting, starting with the most familiar one, foot voting under federalism. Uh, in the United States, uh, foot voting under federalism can potentially give people a very wide range of choices. We have 50 states and a number of territories, many thousands of local governments uh, with different kinds of policies. That gives you a much wider range of options than you can just by choosing the Democrats or the Republicans at the national level, and it makes it more likely that you can find options that uh, will fit your particular preferences uh, and needs. Historically, this has been particularly valuable to the poor and disadvantaged, to groups that are badly off or discriminated against in particular areas. A famous example is African-Americans 
fleeing the Jim Crow era South, more recently gays and lesbians moving to uh, more tolerant and friendly jurisdictions. There are many other historical examples of this that uh, can be mentioned. I'll just add one more that is sort of interesting. In the 19th century, a number of Western states like Wyoming and Utah that you wouldn't think of being as especially progressive or egalitarian, they gave equal rights to women, including the vote before any Eastern states did. Why? Because initially the settlers there were mostly men. The men quickly figured out that, you know, uh, we're not likely to get married if uh, the male-female ratio here is like five to one or whatever it was at the time. So they offered women more rights to come there. And that's an example of women at that time, definitely in a press group, uh, you know, were able to uh, take advantage of vote voting opportunities. And there's many other examples like this throughout American history and that of other federal systems uh, as well. Uh, in more recent years, obstacles have arisen to uh, foot voting under federalism. The biggest one is exclusionary zoning, which sadly in many parts of the country makes it almost impossible to build new housing in response to demand and does in particular makes it hard for the poor and the lower middle class to move to these places. Uh, in the book, uh, I offer proposals for uh, reducing that problem and also for breaking down other barriers to interjurisdictional mobility. I'll take questions at the end. Yeah, that's right. Right. Uh, um, so it might be that some questions will be answered during the process of the talk. Uh, and that way we'll get through, and I promise I will get to everyone's question. I'll stay as long as necessary to do that. Uh, so uh, there are obviously other potential limitations to foot voting under federalism. The most obvious one is moving costs, uh, that it might be costly in various ways to move. There is no way to completely eliminate this problem, uh, but one way to reduce it is if you decentralize power to lower levels of government, it's often less costly to move from one town to another in the same general region than it is to move across the country. Uh, and there are other ways uh, to reduce moving costs as well. In the book, I also deal at some length with other standard objections, such as fears that this would cause a race to the bottom if there was too much opportunity for people to vote with their feet. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about that uh, in the questions. For now, I'll, I'll move on to uh, this issue, which is one of the ones that led me to write a revised edition, which is the implications of remote work for voting with your feet. Uh, and in one sense, uh, the, uh, there's a potentially big advantage here in that it might increase uh, your opportunities for foot voting because now potentially you can separate where you work from where you live. Uh, and therefore you can potentially work for a firm in New York, but live in Omaha, or something like that. Uh, so in that respect, it increases opportunities for foot voting. On the other hand, you can argue it might reduce the, those opportunities because often a big reason in the past for people to vote with their feet is to find more job opportunities. And obviously, if job opportunities are no longer dependent on residency, then this becomes less significant. However, it's also important to recall, especially for people like perhaps many of us in this room, uh, that the vast majority of the population still cannot, in fact, work remotely. Over 80% of Americans uh, who have jobs are employed in jobs where you have to be in the office more than two days a week of work. And even of those who it's not absolutely essential that they be there, uh, sometimes it makes you more productive if you interact with your colleagues in person and the like. So fully remote work is still a, a relatively small minority that can do it. That minority may grow over time, but for now at least, foot voting for job opportunities is still going to be important. And job opportunities often are heavily influenced by variations in government policy. I would add lastly in this section that there are ways to incentivize competition between jurisdictions, which might make these foot voting opportunities even better and more effective in the book, I go through a number of strategies uh, by which that can be done. For now, I'll press on to uh, a form of foot voting, which is probably less familiar, and that is the idea of voting with your feet in the private sector. But although it's less familiar, there are, in fact, private institutions that provide goods and services that are similar to those traditionally provided by state and local governments. The best example, private planned communities. Uh, and uh, these are things like homeowners associations, condominiums, and others, which provide all sorts of goods and services that local governments often provide, including things like security, 
entertainment, even education uh, in many cases. And there are already over 70 million Americans who live in these types of institutions. So uh, this is already a widespread practice. That figure refutes by itself, I think, the traditional criticism that this is something that only the wealthy can do, or as Robert B. Reich famously put it, this is a session of the successful. Uh, unless you have a very broad definition of who counts as wealthy, uh, this just isn't true. Uh, and it also is the case that uh, in a given area, you can fit more private communities and private options than local government, so the freedom of choice can be further expanded, moving costs can be further lowered with these sorts of institutions. Uh, and this applies not just for private and communities, but to a lot of other kinds of private provision of traditional government services. An obvious example is private schooling. If we had universal school choice programs, uh, people could choose to send their kids to private schools instead of public ones if, they, if that's what they wanted to do. And they could even do that without having to physically move, that is without having to uh, buy a house in a uh, new location. And there's a lot of evidence that those sorts of options especially benefit uh, the poor and disadvantaged. It is true, uh, however, that at least in the status quo, these kinds of alternatives are less widely available to the poor and even the lower middle class than to those wealthier. In the book, I offer ways to expand that, including by breaking down restrictions on land use that in many places make it harder to establish new private land communities. I also suggest in line with some previous scholars that we can eliminate the double taxation of people who live in these. That is that if you live in one of these communities and it provides you with services that are traditionally provided by local government, you can get a discount on your taxes, so you're essentially so you're not paying twice uh, for the same service, and that is another way to make this more available uh, to more people. Uh, so it is not my contention that every aspect of government policy can be subject to foot voting through either federalism or in the private sector. There are some problems that are so large scale, perhaps they can only be done by the national government or even by some kind of international body. Global warming is probably an example like that. There are a few others, but the vast majority of uh, policies currently handled by the government are subject to this kind of decentralization as shown by the success of relatively small countries like Denmark, New Zealand, Switzerland, and so forth, which are smaller than many American cities, yet manage perfectly well to have their own education policies, their own pension policies, their own policies in a very wide range of issues. If they can do that, certainly Texas can do it. And indeed, even uh, some sub-regions of Texas or cities like Austin or Houston uh, and the like. So there's a lot of decentralization that we can do to facilitate more foot voting. And there's also ways that we can break down barriers uh, to uh, freedom of movement that makes foot voting possible uh, as well. Uh, I'll now move on to what I think is the most controversial kind of foot voting, foot voting through international migration. Uh, and while it is controversial, obviously, and both the United States and in Europe, we see a considerable political backlash against it in some quarters. Nonetheless, the gains here are truly enormous. Uh, think of whatever you believe is the best governed American state and compare it to whatever you think is the worst. It's probably a significant difference, but it's small compared to the kinds of differences we see with international migration, refugees fleeing Cuba, communist dictatorship, Syrians fleeing the horrible oppression and civil war in that country. More recently, just within the last year, Ukrainians fleeing Vladimir Putin's brutal invasion uh, in the largest refugee crisis in Europe since World War II, and also Russians fleeing Putin's increasingly oppressive regime uh, within Russia itself. Some one million Russians have fled it in the last year. If people in these sorts of situations are able to reach a freer society, uh, they immediately experience vast changes in terms of not just political freedom narrowly defined, but every other kind of freedom or human right uh, as well, whether it's freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, what have you. You can tell a similar story about ethnic minorities, religious minorities fleeing persecution, women fleeing patriarchal societies, like Saudi Arabia uh, and other such examples. The, the, the gains here are just enormous. They're enormous uh, in terms of economic gains as well as freedom. Uh, as also, uh, economists estimate that if we had 
full uh, free migration throughout the world, the world's GDP would double. That is, we would be twice as productive as we currently are. Uh, the reason for this is that there are so many millions of people trapped under governments that are oppressive, corrupt, or otherwise flawed, such that no matter how smart those people are or how hardworking, they have almost no chance of escaping poverty. If a person in this possession is able to move to the US or Canada or Western Europe or another similar free or more successful society, they can almost immediately become two or three times more productive than they were before. And that's not even counting improvements in their skills, which are also more likely to occur in these places uh, than the ones they came from. So the gains uh, are truly enormous. Uh, and uh, uh, on top of that, it's worth noting uh, that for the roughly one third to one half of the world's population that lives under authoritarian governments, foot voting through international migration is virtually their only chance uh, of being able to exercise any political choice at all. They don't even have the sort of one in a million chance that we might have by voting at the ballot box because there is no meaningful ballot box uh, in those countries. Uh, so despite these enormous advantages, there are obviously all sorts of objections <clears throat> to foot voting through international migration. And in the book, I divide them into two categories. One is a set of arguments which says that governments have a general right to keep people out. Uh, and another which says, even if there's no general right, we often have to restrict things in order to prevent particular negative side effects of migration, uh, such as overburdening the welfare state or immigrants being bad voters, voting in terrible governments, and, and so forth. Uh, so uh, I'll start off with the general idea that uh, there is a right to restrict. Uh, the most common form of this is a theory which says that uh, particular parts of the world are owned by specific racial or ethnic groups. And those racial, ethnic, or cultural groups, they have the right to keep other people out. Does the poster up on the screen right now, French nationalist poster, which says, La France aux Français, France for the French. Similarly, we can say Germany for the Germans, Italy for the Italians, and so on. Uh, this sort of argument is commonly heard in many places. You don't get it so often in the US because the implication for us maybe is that Native Americans are the true owners of the land and they have the right to expel everyone else. And that's not an implication. Most American immigration restriction is slight, but even on its own terms and even as applied to other countries, uh, this argument has many severe flaws. Uh, I'll just mention uh, the single biggest one, which is that taken seriously, it's a rationale for ethnic or racial discrimination. Uh, that it says where you live should be determined by what your race or ethnicity is. Uh, we reject this within countries. We reject the racial segregation that occurred under Jim Crow in the US or under South African apartheid. If it's wrong there, it's equally wrong internationally uh, because uh, the reasons why it's wrong domestically also apply internationally. Domestically, it's wrong uh, because what race you are is not something that you can control. And it's not something that determines how good a person you are or how much freedom you're entitled to. And exactly the same thing is true uh, internationally. And I think this point has broader implications, even for immigration restrictions that are not racial or ethnic in nature, uh, because those kind other kinds of restrictions, even so, still generally restrict people based on where they were born or who their parents are. If you were not born in the US and your parents were not US citizens, Generally speaking, you can only get in if the US government gives you special permission to do so. Uh, and this is still arbitrary and unjust because the chance, uh, because obviously you have no control over who your parents are or where you were born, just as you have no control over what race or ethnicity you belong to. And we readily recognize all of this when we think about something like the feudal system of medieval Europe, where if you were born a noble, you could move around freely if you wanted to. On the other hand, if you were a serf, you could only move around if the nobles uh, would let you do so. Uh, and what is the terrible thing that the serfs did that consigned them to this fate? The mistake they made is they chose the wrong parents. So they ended up in the status of being a serf. We readily see why this is wrong, but the current system of immigration restrictions works much the same way. If you're a citizen or if you were born a citizen uh, of a uh, particular uh, 
relatively advanced society, then you're allowed to live there. If you were not born there and you also weren't born to parents who are citizens, then you're not allowed to live there. This is much the same kind of restriction as the restriction based on whether your parents are nobles or whether your parents are serfs. In the United States, uh, as opposed to the ethnic or racial argument, we more often hear this kind of argument, which says that the rights of governments are to exclude people are similar to those of homeowners or members of a club. So uh, I can exclude people from coming into my house if I want to, and I don't necessarily have to have a good reason to say I don't like this person so they can't come in. Uh, similarly, I can form a club where only the people that I and the other members want to be able to join are allowed to enter. For example, I'm a Boston Red Sox fan. I can say only other Red Sox fans are allowed to join this club. Uh, everybody else is out of luck. So similarly, you could say the United States is like a house or a club, and therefore it can keep you well. If you make this argument, uh, it has dire implications, not just for immigrants, but also for natives. Uh, in the consider that the owner of a house has the right to restrict speech or religion within it. I can say only only Republicans are allowed to come into my house, or only Christians. The only form of religious service allowed in the house is a Christian service or a, a Muslim service, whatever uh, one I prefer. Uh, so effectively, if you analogize government policy to this, then it's effectively a justification for a totalitarian state. Almost any kinds of restrictions on liberty uh, that the government wanted to put in uh, would be allowable under this. And of course, you can say the same thing with the club analogy. I can have a Christian club or a Muslim club, a Republican club or a Democratic club that keeps out all but the people who adhere to those viewpoints or those religions. Uh, and so the club analogy also has this totalitarian implication. There are other flaws with these analogies as well that I go into in the book. Uh, but for now, I'm going to go on to theories which say that even if there isn't the general right to exclude people, what there is is a right to uh, exclude people to prevent various kinds of negative side effects. Uh, for instance, maybe immigrants will overburden the welfare state. Uh, maybe uh, they will come in and vote for terrible politicians. I know it's really hard to believe, but if you have too many of the wrong kinds of immigrants, they might elect a president of the United States who has no regard for liberal democratic values whatsoever. And if he loses an election, instead of admitting his defeat and going away, he might incite violence to try to keep himself in power and make false claims of voter fraud and otherwise uh, try to stay in power rather than give it up. Very difficult to believe, but too many of the wrong kinds of voters could result in that. And there's many other kinds of scenarios that people have offered by which immigration might potentially cause harm. I go through them all in the book. Here, I'll just go through the general framework uh, that I advocate for dealing with these kinds of issues. It requires us to ask three questions. <laughs> First, how big is this problem really? In many cases, it turns out that the problem is either non-existent or relatively small. For example, far from overburdening the welfare state, the data shows that the overwhelming majority of immigrants in the US and other advanced nations actually are net contributors to the public fisc. They pay more in taxes uh, than they take out. Similarly, far from increasing crime, uh, they actually have lower crime rates than native born Americans. Do. So the crime rate goes down uh, with more immigration rather than uh, going up. But let's say uh, there really is a problem, and I don't exclude the possibility that in some cases there might be. Still, you would want to ask them the second question, is there a keyhole solution? That is a solution uh, that enables us to address the problem by means less draconian than immigration restrictions. And it turns out uh, in almost every case there is. So if you do worry the immigrants are overburdening the welfare state, we could do more of what we already do under the 1996 Welfare Reform Act, and that is limit immigrant immigrants' eligibility for welfare benefits or even eliminate it entirely. If you worry that immigrants will be bad voters, you can again do more of what we already do. We already say they must wait at least five years before they can become citizens, and even then they must pass a civics test that most native-born Americans would fail if they had to take it without studying for it. Uh, and you could potentially make the test harder, you could make the waiting period longer, and so forth. And there are similar mechanisms for a wide range of uh, other problems as well. But what if there is a problem and for whatever reason there just isn't any keyhole solution? Uh, then still I would want to ask, 
the third question, which is, can we tap some of the vast wealth created by migration to alleviate uh, the problem that way? Remember, I pointed out that uh, free migration throughout the world would double world GDP. That's an enormous amount of additional resources, some of which could potentially be used to address problems caused by <coughs> migration itself. So let's say, for instance, migration did increase crime. You could use some of the money saved, uh, some of the money created by this increase well to hire more police officers. There's a lot of data which shows having more police on the streets reduces crime. Indeed, in the book, I point out that we can get many thousands of new ordinary police officers just by abolishing ICE, the immigration and one of the immigration enforcement arms of the federal government, and spending the same money on regular police. Tens of thousands of additional police officers could be put on the streets by that means alone, and you could do uh, more along those lines if you wanted to. And there are similar tapping the wealth options for many other kinds of potential problems that might be created by uh, migration. This is true for the issue of spreading disease, uh, which during the COVID pandemic led to the most severe immigration restrictions in all of American history, or at least to provide a pretext for putting them in, as there's evidence that under the Trump administration, they already knew this probably wouldn't be much to spread the disease, uh, but they were to contain the disease, but they did institute it anyway. Uh, so if you apply my three-part framework to this, it turns out it works pretty well. It is indeed true that COVID and some other diseases are deadly and dangerous, so I admit there is a real problem. It's actually not at all clear that migration restrictions can prevent the problem from occurring in any significant way. As I noted, we had the most severe immigration restrictions ever, and yet every variant of COVID still got into the United States, and it still got into the United States pretty fast, and the migration restrictions did almost nothing uh, to prevent that. But let's say they were actually effective Still, there are keyhole solutions. One obvious one is a quarantine at the border for seven days or 10 days or however long the CDC or other government agency thinks it's necessary. Uh, a quarantine like that would be a showstopper for people who are coming as tourists or on short-term business. But for a migrant coming to the United States permanently, that's a small price to pay uh, for a lifetime of greater freedom and prosperity. Similarly, when vaccination can uh, stop the spread of disease, you can use a vaccination keyhole. Come in so long as you accept vaccination. Uh, and these keyholes are actually are much better than trying to exclude people entirely, because if you try to exclude people entirely, you get many people trying to come in illegally and not being willing to cooperate with public health authorities. And also you end up with immigration detention centers like the ones we have now, which are themselves actually breeding grounds, not just for COVID, uh, but for other kinds of diseases as well. Uh, I would note also that by restricting immigration, we actually make ourselves more vulnerable to the spread of disease in the long run, uh, because uh, increased migration also increases innovation in science and technology, including those innovations that prevent the spread of disease. Uh, the first two COVID vaccines that were effective uh, in order to deploy the United States, these Pfizer and Moderna ones, they were both developed in large part by immigrants or children of immigrants from poor nations. Uh, if these people had been forced to stay in their countries of origin, they wouldn't have developed those vaccines or certainly wouldn't have developed them as fast. Many more people would have died in COVID. If we increase migration further, we can prevent further problems of this kind. We can potentially cure many more diseases, develop many more vaccines and so forth. Uh, on average, the data shows that immigrants to the US, Canada and Europe produce much more in the way of these sorts of scientific innovations per capita than native born citizens do. In the last part of the book, I talk about a number of institutional implications for both domestic political institutions and for <laughs> constitutional law uh, of this, uh, uh, and also for international law. Here, I'll just summarize a few of these very briefly. Uh, in terms of domestic constitutional design, uh, we want to have obviously a more decentralized constitutional system so as to enable more foot voting and also more competition. We also want to structure it in ways that incentivize competition between subnational governments. Uh, for example, if subnational governments have to raise all or most of their funds on their own, uh, rather than relying on grants from the central government, that gives them more incentive to compete for potential taxpayers. 
Also, there are various constitutional individual rights that can help promote foot voting as well. I give some examples in the book, but an obvious one is the right to property, which enables people to build more housing on their property in response to demand, thereby enabling uh, more internal migration. Another obvious individual right with a connection is uh, the right to travel, uh, the right to freedom of movement. So some national governments should not be allowed to keep people out forcibly, and they also should not be allowed to, in effect, lock their own people in. In history, there are examples of some national governments trying to do both of these things. Uh, fortunately, modern constitutional law in the U.S. for the most part forbids this, but there are some ways in which it can be uh, tightened up. There are also implications for international law. Uh, one of them is for international refugee law, uh, which currently says that governments uh, that sign the Internet and relevant international treaty, they're not allowed to expel refugees, defined as people who, uh, who re legitimately fear persecution on the base of race, religion, political opinions, and a couple of other types of characteristics. Uh, this is good in so far as it goes, uh, but it excludes a wide range of people who are fleeing horrible oppression of other types, uh, including people like some of the ones on the screen earlier, people fleeing communist dictatorships, people fleeing Putin's invasion of Ukraine, there are many other examples like this. Basically, where you have places where there is what I call equal opportunity oppression, people are oppressed in ways that are not directly related to their race, ethnicity, political opinions, and so forth, but just there's a government that's generally oppressive or a war that threatens people with death but isn't specifically targeting those that fall into particular groups, then uh, the, these sorts of people are excluded. Uh, and there's ways we can expand the definition of who counts as a refugee uh, in order to deal with this. At the very least, I would advocate expanding it to include all those people who are fleeing some of the world's most oppressive governments, places like North Korea uh, and others. Uh, there's further expansions that you can do as well. Uh, there is also the implication that we should be wary of world government or so-called global governance, which imposes common government policies uh, on uh, the world as a whole. Obviously, at least until we have space colonies, which I hope we will at some point, but we don't have them yet. Uh, if you have a single policy for the entire world, you cannot vote with your feet against it. That significantly constrains people's political choice and is particularly bad uh, if the world government in question uh, itself becomes tyrannical in any way. And in the book, I go into the possibility that even if there's a low chance per year that a world government would become tyrannical over a period of 50 or 100 years, uh, there's a much higher cumulative chance. So in the worst case scenario, you get what George Orwell feared, a single world government uh, is a boot stamping on a human face forever because there's no way out of it. Uh, and also there isn't even the example effect of other competing governments. Obviously, I don't think there's any significant chance we will get world government or anything like it in the near future, but it is something advocated by some serious thinkers, <coughs> and the implication about foot voting is one that is very brought up other in my book. Uh, I'll end with uh, two other points about the book. One is, in terms of dealing with possible objections that I've gone through, these objections are usually lodged against international migration, but if you take them seriously, they would justify restricting internal freedom of movement as well. Uh, if you worry, if you think that it's legitimate to keep people out because they might overburden a welfare state or increase crime, well, I live in Virginia, right next door to West Virginia, which is much poorer than we are, and they have a higher crime rate. So West Virginians come in, they might overburden our welfare state, they might increase our crime rate and so on. If you think that people of particular culture should be able to keep others out, well, why not people who want to preserve the distinctive culture of Texas against Californians or Oklahomans or whoever else might want to come in? Uh, and I can make a similar point about almost every other rationale uh, for uh, restricting international migration. If you take it seriously, it applies to internal migration uh, as well. Finally, I will note that 50% of all of the royalty generated by this book, they go to causes benefiting refugees. Sadly, both with the Ukraine war and other things going on in the world, uh, that situation is more dire even uh, than it was just a couple years ago.
Uh, so thank you, and I very much look forward to your questions. Should I call on people? Yeah. Okay. So I know it's a couple of you had questions already during the presentation. Uh, if I did not answer your question during the presentation, I'm happy to take it now. That would be the gentleman in the green hair. Uh, Green hair, okay. Uh, it'd, be green, it'd be green, and I, I don't mean that you're hair, I mean that you're, you're hair and that you're wearing green. But, sure. No. Um, uh, I thought maybe something happened in the world. I, I, I hope not, but please uh, go so ahead. You, you appeal a lot to the idea that, uh, so in several cases, you give examples like immigrants to the country are absolutely uh, more law abiding, immigrants to the country are more innovative, they're inventing things at a higher rate than domestic. That's true in a, in a regime where it's costly to immigrate, and therefore only the people who get huge gains from immigration are willing to do it. Would that be true in a world where it was costless to immigrate? So it's never going to be costless to immigrate, at least without radical uh, technological changes. Just because, right? Yeah. So, what is costly? So, so in a world where it's truly zero cost, then maybe it would not be true, though it would still be desirable for, to let people move freely, because even if they still had the, even if they were only as productive or as innovative as natives, or even somewhat less productive and less innovative than natives, there would still be gains from migration, so long as they were more productive and more innovative in the place they moved to than in the place they left from. Uh, and I would note that uh, the greater innovativeness and uh, um, lo lo lower crime rates of, of immigrants existed even during those periods and we had fewer no migration restrictions in the U.S. and they exist currently in countries like Canada which let in many more immigrants per capita than the U.S. does. So it's very unlikely that, the, that these effects, that these differences would go away uh, if we had, uh, you know, if we had no or fewer no legal barriers to migration. But even if they did go away, there would still be huge aggregate gains to migration, to free migration. Uh, it's just that the, the gains would be smaller on a per immigrant basis, but because there would be many more immigrants, the aggregate gains would still be uh, very large. In a very low cost immigration regime, what could possibly explain a, uh, a productivity advantage? So, so the, the, the explanation is that so long as there are differences in productivity between different parts of the world, moving to a high productivity. Well, that makes uh, sense when you're comparing one person to their cells after they move, yep. not comparing one person to the domestic one population there predates Yeah, so uh, my point simply is that uh, if there was truly zero cost, not in just in the sense that the physical movement was costless, but also that there was no cost to adjustment, no cost to experience some cultural change and so forth, in a truly zero cost environment, then maybe you would no longer have an advantage, the immigrants being more productive than natives, but the immigrants would still be more, more productive than native cells would be, and that would be a gain to the world as a whole, which in turn, some of that gain would, would inert to the natives of the destination country. So we're talking about, in, in this example, we're talking about something like a Star Trek world where you know you can just use your Star Trek transporter to materialize and dematerialize in different places and do the same thing with any uh, physical objects that you wanted to move, and we're going even beyond Star Trek and then we're assuming that like a Klingon moving to Earth, the cultural adjustment would be costless and he or she would immediately uh, yeah, and he or she would immediately be able to function in Earth culture or Vulcan culture without any without without having to engage in any costly adjustments of any kind. In that world, we indeed perhaps would not see uh, immigrants being more productive than otherwise similar natives, but we would still, but if we posit that, and I think this is probably true in the Star Trek universe, if you posit that the institutions of Earth tend towards greater productivity than those of the Klingon homeworld, I think it's called Romulus. Uh, no, no, it's not Romulus, it's called Romulus. It's no, not beautiful, the Romulan homeworld, but whatever the Klingon homeworld is, maybe the Klingons are less productive, uh, maybe people there are less productive than those on Earth, then if the Klingons could move to Earth at zero cost, uh, and zero difficulties of adjustment, then you know that would imply the effects that I just just mentioned. Last follow-up question. Sure. Right, somebody else so Sure. How much of the GDP estimate is based on comparing immigrants to the pre-existing population, and how much is driven by comparing immigrants to themselves in their adopted country versus their home country? Um, so, so, so there are several different ways of calculating this. 
Um, uh, and uh, if you're interested in Michael Clemens and his classic article on this called Trillion Dollar Bills on the Sidewalk, he goes through a bunch of different ways. The bottom line is that all the different ways uh, lead to huge results. The doubling is really sort of the sort of the midpoint of the possible estimates. But if you say, like, I believe one of the more conservative estimates, which said instead of doubling, it'll only be 50% greater, that's still enormous, yeah. right? Uh, so uh, so uh, it's a good question. There are different ways of calculating it. If you want to know the different ways, read his article and some of the surrounding literature. Uh, but, uh, but because the differences in institutional quality between countries are so large, uh, it's going to be a big difference no matter how you look at it or at least under any plausible uh, economic theory. I'd like to talk more about the Klingons, but instead I will go to the next question. Uh, go ahead. I yes, have, sir. I have like seven questions. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so I'll, I'll, I'll go to what perhaps will be your less than seven questions, yes. then I'll go to his seven. Great. Um, so the question I have is, uh, I'll be a little sarcastic in, in this and say, you know, where do I move to to avoid inflation? Um, sure. So within the United States, of course, you have uh, federalism and the idea that at the top there, uh, I agree 100% that, that voting is ineffectual. You can't, you know, you can't vote these things out. If there's poor policy, there's poor policy. But you know, it's not that I can really move to avoid that. And then let me add to this that you know, my grandparents came here from Portugal, and um, and I think that. It's not culture so much to me as it is the question of freedom. So I think it's a definition type of thing. So, you know, they, they moved here with their culture, which they felt very strong and strongly attached to, but believed in the idea of freedom and the American dream. And that was very unique because it didn't involve all of these sort of attributes and identifying people by this group or that group or this country or that country or whatever, that everybody was a big melting pot. And that's kind of what made things unique. And to me, is what attracted everybody that's here. Um, so, so I think there are some issues to me with the definition part of this. So, you know, to me, it's currently on the wrong path and we're moving more towards measuring the attributes and Getting into actually some of the problems that you're talking about. I think that in the United States, of course, there's times in history when we can point to discrimination and all of these problems, but maybe if we actually moved more towards the principles of freedom, then these desires would be fulfilled and, and, and accepting the people that want to have freedom. Not necessarily the culture, but freedom. But so there's at least three different issues that that raises, maybe more. If I'm missing something, I'll follow up in a moment. Uh, one is there may be some things you can't move to avoid, like uh, if we have a single currency for the entire US and it's being inflated, moving from one state to another won't get you anywhere. So that's true. Uh, there's not a perfect remedy for that, but obviously international migration can help with that. Uh, and there is a history of people moving out of countries with chronic high inflation. Argentina suffered more out migration when they had uh, chronic high inflation and other policies. I think there would be more opportunity to escape these things. A second possibility, and I'm not a monetary economist, I don't know whether this is truly desirable or not, but you could potentially have subnational currencies. Uh, for instance, many people argue that the European Union made a mistake in creating the euro. Uh, they should have maintained their previous regime of having freedom of movement throughout the European Union, but different national currencies. There are actually still some countries that are members of the European Union that don't have the euro. So uh, I'm not saying this is the best policy in the US, but if, if each state had its own currency, potentially you'd have lower inflation states versus higher inflation states. I'm not fully advocating this. Again, monetary economics, I have to respect the limits of my expertise. So it could be, it would be so terrible if we had 50 different currencies that the benefit, the, the cost would, would outweigh this, this benefit. But decentralization is another way uh, of dealing with that. Uh, a second uh, issue that your question raises is that sort of maybe the concern that we have is not that immigrants might have a bad culture, but that they might have bad attitudes towards freedom. So 
they voted socialist policies or fascist policies or, or whatnot. And uh, this is one of these questions towards which my three-part framework uh, can address. Uh, one is it turns out that at least for the US and Canada and Western Europe, this isn't that big a problem in that if you measure the political views of immigrants compared to those of natives, on most issues, there's not that big a difference. There is a big difference in immigration itself. Immigrants are more, on average, more pro-immigration than natives, but on most other issues, first and second generation immigrants, it's not a big difference. It's a modest difference, sometimes in what I would think is a good direction, sometimes what I think is a bad direction, but it's not that big a difference. And on top of that, recent immigrants on a per capita basis have less political influence than natives because they vote at lower rates and they participate in politics at lower rates by a much greater margin. They don't contribute much in the way of financial contribution to campaigns and the like. If you think that immigrant political participation is a good thing, you may view that negatively. But if you worry that immigrants will vote for the wrong people, then you should be reassured uh, by, you know, by these kinds of uh, numbers. But if you worry that actually it is a problem, again, as I said before, you can extend the period before which they're allowed to be citizens. You could make the test harder or change the composition of the test and so forth. So there, there are key holes uh, uh, for that. Uh, uh, finally, uh, in terms of the goal is to promote a general society of freedom, immigration <coughs> restrictions obviously themselves severely restrict people's freedom. Uh, certainly that's true for the immigrants, but it's even true for the natives, right? Because the natives are restricted from hiring immigrants for jobs, they're restricted from working at businesses those immigrants might found, uh, they're restricted from marrying the immigrants and socializing with them, and it's even the case that with our immigration enforcement regime, we view things like every year there are hundreds or even thousands of, of, uh, of current U.S. citizens that end up in immigration detention, and in some cases even get supported because the due process pro protections are so bad that sometimes before ICE and other government agencies figure out that this person is actually a U.S. citizen, you know, weeks or months might pass. So, and there are other ways in which the liberty of natives are also restricted by immigration restrictions as well. I, you can in theory imagine a scenario where the impact of immigration on liberty is so bad uh, that it outweighs all of that and none of the key holes that I mentioned would be effective, but such cases are extreme and rare. Uh, not, there's not even actually one historical example you can point to of a liberal democratic government being significantly degraded by immigration. Whereas on the other hand, there are many examples where they're significantly degraded by native born nationalists, uh, including people who advocate the kinds of ideologies, immigration restrictions, like obviously Nazi Germany is the most extreme example, uh, um, but there are many other ones. So I'm not saying all of these cases are like Nazi Germany, but even less extreme sort of native born nationalists who are not as bad as Nazis, they still have undermined quite a lot of uh, you know, liberal democratic regimes. Vladimir Putin is the product of this sort of movement. Uh, what's happening in Turkey is a result of this kind of ideology. Orban in Hungary, and I can go on with many, many other examples like that. So if any, if we're going to restrict freedom for the purpose of preventing bad governments from coming into power, uh, native nationalists are probably a better uh, target for your efforts. I'm not saying that's what you want to do, but for those who do want to do that, that's probably a better target for their efforts than uh, immigration is. In the book, in a new edition, I also talk about the uh, argument that the problem with immigration is not that the immigrants themselves have bad political views, but that they will stimulate negative reactions by natives. So the natives might be, is that the problem is not that the immigrants are fascists, or communists or whatever, but that the natives might become fascists in response to immigrants. And in the book, I give you know, various answers <coughs> to that uh, concern. I won't go through them all because I don't want to take more time because uh, I probably have already spent more time on that question I did before. I know I promised you would get to go next, but I have not forgotten about your question. Uh, all right, so I'm going to tackle to, to the beginning of the talk uh, when you talked about co voting uh, within the US yes. in particular. Uh, do we have enough evidence on people actually moving because they're moving? For policy for policies versus just like, you know, I have got a job in Texas, there are more jobs in Texas. They don't really care if you're going to have to work in or if you Yeah, yeah. So, no, no, no. I think the economics is, is a result of policy to some extent, but there's like all sorts of other policies, a bundle of policies, right? Yeah, yeah. And do we have a way to yeah, so, so, to so, so, to some extent, uh, he partially provided the answer that I was going to give. Oh, just lack of policy. Yeah, so, <laughs> so it, to some extent, lack of policy is also a policy when right, right. the state or local government had the option of implementing a policy. So uh, I agree, certainly, there are things that determine where you migrate 
that are unrelated to policy, like even though I don't have this preference myself, lots of data shows people prefer warmer weather, right? So one of the reasons why Florida is a big gainer for interstate migration, people like weather, I don't, I, I hate hot human weather, but most people don't feel that way. Uh, and so and there's other factors like that, like if you fall in love and the person, your true love says like, I only want to live in Nome, Alaska, that's the only place I want to be, in. That, that could be an example of you move there because, you know, for, for her, because it, to be with her, even otherwise, like I hate film, I don't like the cold or whatever. Um, nonetheless, there is a lot of evidence that, that the things that drive most interstate migration in the US are at least related to policy. Jobs are a big factor, housing costs are a big factor, the taxation rates matter as well. There's also some evidence that more diverse jurisdictions and more tolerant jurisdictions uh, attract more people also. So if you look at sort of the places in the US that attract the most people, they tend to be actually places like Austin, which are sort of blue, relatively tolerant jurisdictions within red states, where the red state government constrains to some degree the, the local jurisdictions uh, more sort of what would otherwise be their more interventionist economic policy. So I completely agree that policy is not the only thing that drives migration, either interstate or even internationally, but it's a big factor, especially when you include these indirect effects on jobs, housing, crime, uh, and you know, other things of that sort. So here's my follow up. Sure. I'm glad you got to the Austin part. Um, it's sort of like seeing that there's a dynamic where and this applies to California, where yes, the red state is very attracted by its economic policies, lots of good things, and then it's got more quote, cosmopolitan dollar in place like Austin, might be very attractive to a certain kind of people, and that becomes this sort of sweet spot, right? But then there's a tendency, and it's not very exacerbated of late, but it did happen in California, that the whole state of California then turns into a giant group, then, that then undermines all the policies that the red state is seeking to charge, you know, control, and then all this migration ended up leading to a from California, and now people are moving out, right? So with freedom of movement in different directions, it's great to get different opportunities in places. And I think you see within the US this notion that, yeah, you went to California for a while, now people moving out of California, maybe now Texas, you see the people, maybe oh, I mean, sometimes, but now people move out of Texas. And that's sort of like, if I can think about that model for a world model, it seems that that's okay. If you had open borders, that would protest out here, it would be totally, totally fine. But here's my concern. If we have some bad units in the West. They're all sort of okay, and you know the differences locally, and then you can see these movement going back and forth. But in the world, do you foresee a situation where I don't know what the estimates would be that one billion people will come to the US if you were to open there, right? So this would be the US would be such an attractive beacon for for people. And yeah, that would be dynamic and great for a while, but that would turn into something that would be very yeah, so I think there's the, so I think there's several different questions that are uh, contained in that, let me try to break them break down. Up. So I'll take it from the end. First, like, isn't there a risk of swamping, right? That so many people might come in that like the, they would swap the, the local culture or local political system. And if that system is good, at least in some important ways, they could get swamped. Uh, I have uh, a couple kinds of response to that argument. Like I have a whole section devoted to swamping in chapter six of the book. Uh, one is that it's unlikely to happen that fast because uh, job markets, real estate markets, moving costs constrain people from moving that quickly. And therefore, well, eventually we might have a doubling of the US population or something like that. It would not happen. It would happen over a period of 20 or 30 years rather than over a period of one or two years. There's a downside to that, and that is that the big economic gain zone it would take a while to happen as well, but sort of immediate swamping is unlikely. Uh, secondly, there are studies done, many of them by Alex Nebrastek, my colleague at the Cato Institute. I have a second job at the Cato Institute, in addition to my job at George Mason. Uh, Alex has done some good research on places like Jordan and Israel, which haven't had, had, have in fact recently had big sudden influxes of people. And not only that, those big sudden influxes were for people moving from places which were illiberal and had bad political cultures in Israel's case. Russian Jews, people like me, who be rapidly rose from being maybe a small percentage of Israel population, being like 25% of the total, uh, in Jordan's case, Palestinians uh, uh, fleeing from uh, Kuwait and the Gulf countries and the like. And in each case, there was no evidence of degradation of institutional uh, uh, culture and the like. Now, that doesn't, so the, the combination of the fact of how fast it really would be, and also these empirical cases, 
this doesn't categorically rule out the possibility that in some conceivable situation you get a swamping effect, but it makes it much less likely, particularly for a big country with well-established institutions like the US. In the book, I give the example of Estonia faced by Russia. They have only 1 million people in Estonia. Russia has 100 million right next door, and it's much more illiberal than Estonia. So a swamping scenario there is at least somewhat plausible. In the case of the US and most other um, more sizable first world nations, uh, that swamping scenario is extremely unlikely. You could say, well, even a small chance of this is not worth it, but you can also posit that not letting in more people, there's a small chance of catastrophe as well. For instance, you might keep out the person who would otherwise have created the cure for the next pandemic that kills millions of people. Uh, there is a real chance uh, you know, that migration restrictions would, would prevent that. So if you're going to weigh low probability catastrophic scenarios, you're going to be weighed on both sides. Uh, the other question that I think that raises, uh, and I'm not sure if this entirely had in mind, but it's the fear of a kind of big sort uh, that, uh, you know, if all the conservatives or most of them would move to one set of place, all the liberals would another set of place, it'd be more polarized. These areas would be more homogenous. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is a concern raised by some people. And my answer, I addressed that in the book as well. Uh, my answer to it is that when you look at actual migration patterns, they don't actually break down a line left, right ideological lines that much. For instance, Texas is one of the biggest gainers uh, of interstate migrants over the last couple of decades. But if you look at surveys of are they Democrats or Republicans, they're actually divided almost 50-50 between Democrats and Republicans because when people vote with their feet, they make their decisions in a more sophisticated way to include left, right ideological uh, lines. Uh, so, uh, I'm not that worried about a big sort happening. Though, if there are some places which are overwhelmingly left or overwhelmingly right, that's not a terrible thing uh, because Heather Gerken, the dean of Yale Law School, who's <coughs> becoming dean, she wrote a, an important article on what she calls second order diversity, where she points out that you wouldn't want all of the institutions in a system to be internally diverse in the same way. Like if they all had 50% Democrats and 50% Republicans, the same percentages of whites, blacks, Hispanics, and other groups, the same percentage of different religions, that even though there would be internal diversity in each place, every place would actually be exactly the same as every place else. So you might want some places whose internal diversity is skewed so as to create more of what she calls second order diversity. So uh, in, we wouldn't want every place to be homogenous, but we also wouldn't want every place to be diverse and exact in exactly the same way. And fortunately, foot voting usually gets us somewhere in a, in a happy middle between those two extremes. Uh, so uh, I don't know, oh yes, uh, you were waiting patiently. Please go ahead. Sure, you finished your speech all with the perils of world government. Yeah. But earlier in the speech, you referred to certain <laughs> issues which could only be handled worldwide. Yeah. You mentioned global warming, which I thought it did now called climate change. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm old fashioned, I'm using the old fashioned term. I'm, pretty, pretty. I'm curious what other issues you see out there that can only be handled by the world government. Any so I don't believe actually. To save everyone from those yeah. So I was thinking, what is only handled on a worldwide level doesn't necessarily mean that a world government is necessary to do it. It could be dealt with through cooperation between a few of the most powerful nations or blocks. Uh, secondly, I think that. Uh, there are very few, if any, other such issues. Uh, climate change may, is almost the only one because the characteristic you would want to have in an issue like that is that it's a global public good in an economic sense. Uh, and also that individual nations have little or relatively little incentive to try to address it, at least address on the scale that would be necessary. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, with vaccination, uh, there are advantages to individual nations getting their populations vaccinated, even if the rest of the world doesn't. Uh, and therefore, I'm not so worried in that kind of case. And in fact, we did just see individual nations vaccinate their population, not always really as quickly as would be desirable. But we certainly, very few people in the U.S. said we won't, we shouldn't vaccinate the U.S. until Canada gets vaccinated or until Europe. Like hardly, whereas it's common for people to say, well, maybe we should restrict our emissions, but only if China restricts theirs, because if we uh, if we restrict ours, but they don't restrict theirs, the scale, you know, they may even increase theirs, wherever the scale of the problem would just be the same. So I think there's very few issues 
which have this characteristic of being a global public good, and also there is relatively little incentive for individual nations to address them. Now, maybe returning to Star Trek, if the Klingons were going to invade the Earth or whatever, and there's a threat of extraterrestrial invasion, maybe that would be a global public good of a similar kind, and you can posit other scenarios. But in general, I think such cases are rare, which is why I think the vast majority of functions of government can be at the very least done by individual nations, and in many cases, decentralized to lower levels of that. And as a follow-up question, sure. let's say we signed a treaty, whatever you want to call it, with the Chinese to reduce emissions, and they didn't, and they didn't follow the treaty. Or you, how do you so if I had a simple, easy solution to that problem, I would have written a book about that. Um, but obviously, there is an entire literature on international agreements and when people have incentives to follow them. Uh, and you know, sometimes they do, and then once you commit to an agreement, if you violate it, that damages your reputation and makes it, you know, and it makes it harder for you to get other agreements that you want in the future. There might be you know, sanctions that can be imposed or the like. But yes, it is difficult, particularly with something like climate change, where you know, if we want to, you are like a significant reduction in emissions means that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a costly thing to do. Uh, and it's a, you know, you, know you, you guys perhaps should host a whole other event on that kind of issue. Yeah, we have. Oh, yeah, you probably, so okay, I'm not going to all the events you've done. Um, but the last thing I would mention about is I do have a section on environmental harms in my book where I point out that in general, wealthier societies deal better with environmental problems than poorer ones. Uh, free migration can make the world vastly wealthier, which means more technological innovation. And it also means that if we do have to restrict emissions, uh, it will be less painful for a very well, for a much wealthier society to do it than for a relatively poor one. Doesn't mean that we would definitively succeed in addressing that problem, but the wealthier we are, I think the more likely it is uh, that we could do it. And also the more likely that we can come up with clean energy innovations. Though as Brian Kaplan is sitting here has pointed out, in some ways we already have you know, a, a valuable form of clean energy that we're underutilizing in the form of nuclear power. Uh, but I imagine also a wealthier society could do more in the way of utilizing nuclear power uh, as well. Uh, so I, since I mentioned you, Brian, I will call on, on you next. And I, I know you want to speak again, but yeah, you did ask the previous question, so I'm trying to get in people who have not spoken yet. Brian, go ahead. I've got a story about why so many people do not like the idea of foot voting, sure. and it's this. The idea of foot voting shows a great democracy such that people complain about things that they would never actually take a serious effort to avoid. On the other end, many things that people really talk about and actually are highly motivating. And it really just holds up a mirror to humanity and it upsets people. Yep. So, about that. so I know you've written blog posts about this. Let me I know exactly what we're talking about, but I want to expand a little bit for those who do not religiously read every one of your posts as I do. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I think what Brian is trying to correct me if I have you wrong, but is that uh, if, you, if, if people, if you ask people sort of what is the most important thing in the world, or what are some that they might think, you know, religion, high moral principles, uh, um, you know, serving the interest of the nation and so forth. But then if you see what is it that motivates people to vote with their feet, for most people it seems like in this place I didn't get a good, I, I, I'll get a better job, lower taxes. For some people, it is also that they don't get to practice their religion and the like. So that is actually a not uncommon situation. So the argument, I guess, there is that uh, people's real priorities are less noble than what they say they are. And I think that's true to some extent. I'm not convinced that this is what motivates opposition to foot voting. I think a much more common source of opposition to foot voting is an implicit assumption uh, that the world is sort of zero sum. So more gains for migrants means less for us. And also, uh, when it comes to international migration, the biggest single predictor of being opposed to it is your general level of xenophobia and suspicion of foreigners, which is partially related to this zero sum mentality, but partially also related to uh, the, uh, you know, a sort of natural human uh, sense of, uh, you know, in group, out group kind of dynamics. It is not my argument, by the way, that that means there are no serious objections to migration rights that can be raised. There are intellectually serious objections. My point is simply that the intellectually serious objections are not usually the main reasons why public opinion uh, uh, doesn't like foot voting or a lot of it uh, doesn't like it. I'm also not convinced that this sort of fear of recognizing 
hypocrisy of the kind that Brian points to is a major motivator. Though, if you have survey data which suggests that it is, I'm, I'm happy to consider it. Uh, yes. So, the optimal world is a world that it's very hard for us to get to. Uh, sure. In the sense that you know, every single, almost the best majority of countries in the world has their single conditions. Yeah. Very, very good. You can change all of them, right? Um, but if you were to now, you know, start advising the 2025 new administration, you're in charge of like drafting a plan to get us to more immigration. What, what, what are the sort of my like, priorities? So I'll make a general point about that and about more specific points. The general point is this, like there might be some issues where you can achieve a big improvement, but you can only achieve it if you go all the way. Like there are some forms of deregulation where that might be true. Like I've heard it said that sort of electricity deregulation is like this. Like you can have huge gains, but only if you go all the way and do it just right. And if you go halfway, you're going to sink away still and it's going to be terrible. With lowering immigration restrictions and also lowering domestic barriers to freedom of movement, it's not like this. If the U.S. takes 10% more migrants per year, that's another 100,000 people that live a freer and happier life every year. And it's a big game for, for the natives as well. If we reduce zoning restrictions in places which have severe ones by 10 or 20%, that's thousands of new houses that can be built, that also thousands of people that can move to opportunity. And I can go on with examples like this. So, this is an area where even if you're not as radical as I am, and most people admit we are not, there is huge amounts of room for incremental improvement and relatively little likelihood that making an incremental improvement will lead you to some sort of trap like with the super complex electricity deregulation or with certain kinds of monetary policy reforms I mentioned earlier where I wasn't sure whether those reforms are justifiable or not. So there's lots and lots of opportunities. I am not a great short-term political strategist if I were to make a move or lucrative income doing something else than what I'm actually doing. But I do have some thoughts and things that can be done. Some are actually being done right now. The Biden administration has massively expanded private refugee sponsorship with the Uniting for Ukraine program, where I actually have participated as a sponsor. You can now, by filling out a pretty simple form, you can sponsor uh, not just one, but an entire family of Ukrainians to come into the US uh, uh, in a very simple process. And he had just now expanded that to include people from four other countries, uh, Nicaragua, Cuba, Venezuela, and Haiti. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the Uniting for Ukraine parties have proven to be pretty popular uh, and, a, and a durable reform. And already over uh, something like over 150,000 people have been authorized to come into the US in, that risk in less than a year. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and Canada has done private refugee sponsor of this kind for many years, enabling thousands of people to move that way. So, uh, it seems like uh, what makes these programs relatively popular is the sense of like, well, if anything goes wrong, the sponsor will be responsible, which is a legal matter, but it is not true. Uh, but people were re the public opinion seems to be reassured by that. Uh, and also, obviously, in some cases, it makes a difference that there's great sympathy for some of the particular groups like with the Ukrainians who really are fleeing wars. That's true. Uh, although it's also the case that many migrants from other places are also fleeing comparable wars. There's other kinds of low hanging fruit that can potentially be picked up in certain uh, places as well. Uh, but I'm not, again, I'm not a great uh, short term strategist. I will merely mention this one more thing, uh, which is. Uh, that um, I think uh, advocates of uh, lowering immigration restrictions have not sufficiently learned the lessons of previous successful struggles for greater freedom and equality, like uh, the abolition movement, the civil rights movement, the gay rights movement. Those movements were successful in large part by showing that the groups for whom they wanted to increase freedom were not fundamentally different from the rest of us. So, uh, and therefore that the barriers against them were arbitrary. So the, the most famous uh, symbol of the anti-slavery movement was this uh, picture of a black man in chains and underneath is a sign saying, am I not a man and a brother, right? So the idea is that ultimately a black man is a man in much the same way as a white man is. So it's arbitrary to say because he's black, he should be a slave. Uh, gay rights advocates, women's rights advocates and so on made similar points uh, I, to my mind advocates of lowering immigration restrictions have not sufficiently emphasized this point of what we have is an arbitrary restriction based on who your parents are, where you were born, that's similar to racial and ethnic discrimination 
Uh, and uh, uh, I'm not saying this is this argument will persuade everybody, but it has been very successful in past movements. Uh, and you know, Martin Luther King, similar message. Uh, Martin Luther King, in his speeches, he would say things like uh, that. You know, the color of uh, we should judge people by the content of their character, not by the color of their skin. That was more persuasive than the report of the President's Council of Economic Advisors issued the same year, which pointed out correctly that if you eliminate segregation and various forms of discrimination, blacks would be more productive and therefore the overall economy would be better. Absolutely correct Econ 101. I would bet, Brian, you agree with that. But uh, hardly anybody was persuaded by, uh, by hardly anybody who was persuaded by, you know, by the, uh, the report of the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, whereas millions of people over time were persuaded by arguments like the kind that King made. And the same thing with Nancy Swavery. There was a man named Hidden Helper who wrote a couple of lengthy books arguing that poor whites would be better off from the, in an economic sense from the abolition of slavery uh, because black is that slave labor wouldn't compete with poor white labor or the other beneficial economic effects. Hidden Helper was much less successful than Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote with, with her book Uncle Tom's Cabin, which all of you probably have heard of. Uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin does not talk about, you know, if Uncle Tom were free, whites would be better off economically. They would probably they actually would be if he was free. What it focuses on is how Uncle Tom is the person not fundamentally different from white people. And you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of people bought her book, read it, and said, wow, this, this seems true. Uh, whereas uh, Hidden Helper's book sales were much lower than hers, and he was much less successful. I see what you're planning, Bryce. Sorry? I, I see what your, book, your books are you know, aiming at. So, don't around, in my book, I do, in fact, have lots of policy wandry type things, too, like about the rest. <laughs> but I do that not because I think it will persuade public opinion, but because I think an intellectually serious defense of a position has to address serious arguments on the other side. But I do not believe that, I, that either I or anybody can achieve big changes in public opinion with arguments about keyholes and the like. I just think that to advance the state of our knowledge on this issue, we have to address serious arguments, uh, or at least some of us have to. Uh, if I were a politician or an activist, you know, I might do things differently, but I think that's not where my comparative advantage lies. But to those who are activists, I would urge them to talk about, you know, we are restricted people based on who their parents are, where they were born, it's just as arbitrary as, uh, you know, uh, racial segregation was, or as, you know, discrimination against women was, and uh, similarly, there's, I, I've written a bit, there's a, about this, there's a, some great work in how same-sex marriage succeeded as quickly as it did, but the big argument, that, the big successful argument that advocates made was that same-sex relations are fine, fun, or relations are fundamentally similar to opposite-sex ones. They love each other. They can raise children. They get all the same. And so, why should we arbitrarily limit their ability to do that uh, on that basis? Uh, you know, when we allow heterosexuals uh, to do it, it was, and they did not prevail by arguing, well, uh, you know, gays will be more productive if they can get married. And, uh, uh, and that in turn will improve society as a whole. Uh, and like that's true, by the way, they, they can be an R, but it's but it's not the kind of argument that persuaded many people. Yes. Uh, so you mentioned decentralizing government and federalism. Um, and yes. You know, and then the smaller scale, but is that easy to go hand in hand with like, only migration? So not necessarily. Uh, if we expand foot voting within countries. Uh, and that's a good thing, even if we don't simultaneously expand international migration. Uh, but uh, it's even, but it's even better if we do both simultaneously. Indeed, there are synergies uh, because when a person moves to the U.S., let's say, they can also choose between 50 different states. In fact, when I was working with our sponsor family in the United States Ukraine program, this is actually something we talked about with them, like which state they should go to. Uh, they eventually picked a state in part because they already had friends who were living there, which for immigrant adjustment is important. But, uh, but if you have decentralization within countries, that suddenly moving to the United States is not even just the US versus your previous country, it's potentially 50 different options and more even maybe thousands of different options being about local governments as, as well as state governments as, as possibilities. So there are these uh, synergies. But even if we have exactly the same immigration policies, now and we don't change them in any way, it would still be advantageous to expand foot voting opportunities within the United States and also within other uh, countries as well. Yes. Uh, so, you know, 
other questions. I know uh, we've been going for a while, and I, I don't want to keep people from your exciting Friday. Yeah, I don't want to keep you. You must be tired. So, uh, no, I, I could go all night and all day <laughs> talking about this stuff. You might be Brian knows, but but, but I, 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 I have some questions. So sure, go ahead. You got my, the related to this point of portfolio. Certainly, you mentioned that the, the major barriers to voting are things like uh, housing restrictions. Yeah, like in the U.S. In the U.S. Yeah, exactly. In the U.S. Isn't that a lot of evidence also of one of the major problems these days? Is that a lot of federal loan benefits are attached to things that the you know, your state level sort of like administrator of that plan. So a poor person in West Virginia that's on some sort of welfare right now, if that person has an opportunity in Texas, it's actually more complicated for them to be able so, to and not lose their benefits. So there are some federal benefits which work like that, and the aggregate effect of is much less than that of housing restrictions. Uh, but there are some effects like that uh, where in particular you might get because, or what's really at stake often is that uh, state benefits vary somewhat uh, um, in that respect. Though actually, the Supreme Court has ruled that uh, uh, that, it, that if a, that a new arrival has to get the same benefits as existing residents of the state, so that to some extent uh, you know eliminates that, but, but not totally. Uh, there is also the issue of in the tax code. In the, the way the U.S. healthcare policy works uh, is that there is a strong incentive for health insurance to be attached to your employer, uh, and that limits mobility somewhat. In that uh, you, you you can't keep the same health insurance. And uh, I, this is a point that I should have included in the book, but maybe if there's ever a third edition, I will. Uh, that it would be desirable uh, to make uh, the tax treatment of health insurance that you buy independently of your employer uh, be equal to that which you get from your employer because if you get it from through your employer then it's tax free uh, and it would also be desirable to allow people more opportunity to buy health insurance uh, across state lines uh, but those barriers are not as significant in terms of their effects as uh, exclusionary zoning which is by far the biggest domestic american constraint the second biggest one may be occupational licensing in that some 30 percent of american workers have to have licenses to their jobs and it's not just the doctors or lawyers like me it's people like hairdressers uh and so forth uh, uh with, with our ukrainian family ironically the single biggest bureaucratic problem we run into so far is that uh, uh one of them she's a professional hairdresser she's worked on that for several years in ukraine and now we are briefly in spain but it turns out that to become licensed as a hairdresser in florida it is possible that she will have to take 1200 hours of classes uh um that it, it costs thousands of dollars and takes nine months uh it all depends whether she has to or not depends on a technical <laughs> uh point of florida law that i and some other experts are helping her to try to deal with um uh, but even if she doesn't have to take the class she will still have to take a complicated exam in english which obviously is difficult for, for a just arrived immigrant uh and all of this for a person who's very obvious that she is a hairdresser she's been doing it for several years and if it turns out god forbid that she's a bad hairdresser consumers can figure that out they're like after you get one bad hair <laughs> This is not like she's doing brain surgery or whatever, but yet uh, this has turned out to be actually harder to deal with than actually than the you know the, the process of entering the U.S., which in the case of United for Ukraine beneficiaries is uh, remarkably fast. For those who are interested in this, I have an article that I wrote about this in the Washington Post, which is based not just on my experience but the general structure of the program. And if you don't want to pay the get through the Washington Post paywall, the Cato Institute has reprinted it on their website where it's available for free. If you Google my name and United Free Air, you can find us. Uh, All right, CEO, yeah, great. And uh, thank you again. Thank you so much.